So good evening, every, everyone. Um, the theme of this evening's tutorial is the principles and the management of non-unions. These are a few learning objectives that I would like you guys to take home from this presentation, and that is to give attention to the host, the importance of the optimal mechanical environment for bone healing, to have a specific treatment strategy for the different non-union types, and to set clear treatment goals when dealing with non-unions. So um, I'm sure many of you have seen this picture before, because I always like showing it. And this is just to show that um, in nature, fractures heal. So um, as you can see here, this is from hunting in the Karoo and it's an oryx horn. And as you can see there, that um, there was a fracture of the horn and it heals with a big ball of callus formation. So often the only thing that we need to do to achieve union is just stay away. And in, overall in orthopedics, the incidence of non-union is higher in operative orthopedics than in non-operative treatment. The second important message at this is that there's no substitute for sound mechanics. So in a situation like this, you can add any biological stimulation you wish, bone graft, BMPs, and all of them combined, but you won't achieve union without addressing the mechanical instability. And then lastly, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet um, for the Harry Potter fans. If only we had uh, Skiddy Grow in real life, there's unfortunately no single intervention that will achieve union in every case of non-union. One of the problems in the management of non-unions is the lack of accepted definitions. The most widely used of a definition of a non-union is that um, as <clears throat> defined by the US FDA in 1986 and that is of a fracture not united at nine months and with no progress over the preceding three months. The most widely accepted uh, definition of a, non of a delayed union is that of a fracture not expected to heal in the time frame for that specific um, fracture. Now, as you can see, those definitions are pretty vague and definitely can't apply to all fractures because as we know, mostly fractures in the upper limb heal a little bit quicker than fractures in the lower limb. So we can't have one definition that applies to every fracture. So I like the definition as suggested by Nando Ferrara in his article on the management of tibial non-unions where they include the so-called potential non-union as any fracture taken into account the host, the injury and the management up to date with little potential to heal without intervention. And an established non-union as a non-union with no clinical or radiological signs of union in a reasonable time expected for that fracture. So, in other words, you can decide at any stage to intervene and cause something in non-union if you think that there's no, um, there's no chance that this fracture will heal without intervention. So what do we need for bone to heal? Well, in the case of a fracture, we have sort of four key ingredients. We need a osteoconductive scaffold, or that's translated as two live bone ends. We need the optical, optimal mechanical environment. We need um, a good local biologic environment, and that is the presence of osteogenic cells. And then we also need the right systemic biologic environment, and that is the presence of some growth factors. So this is illustrated in the so-called diamond theory um, of fracture healing. I'm not a fan of this theory um, and how we prescribe the treatment of all non-unions, but it is important to think of the, these four ingredients for, um, for, for the healing of fractures. 
and it can help you to identify where the problem is when you address non-unions. So what contributes to, the, to a non-union? Well, there's some host factors, and these can be both local and systemic. There's the injury itself, and then there's often contribution um, from the surgery, especially poor surgery. So again, Nandu looked at a series of tibial non-unions, and they identified certain risk factors for the development of a non-union. And these included open fractures, smoking, uh, HIV positive status, diabetes, where internal fixation was used with a fracture gap and also cases of compartment syndrome. So there's various uh, host factors that affect union, some of which some of them um, we can change and some of them unfortunately not. Age is a big contributing factor in union, nutrition, comorbidities, specifically anemia, peripheral vascular disease, diabetes and a head injury, endocrine abnormalities of which vitamin D deficiency is the most common, and then also quite a long list of medication. These include steroids, anti-inflammatories, PPIs, DMARDs, biologics, ARV, chemotherapy. Now in some instances, like with NSAIDs, they're mostly taken for pain, so we can stop these to try and achieve union in a fracture or in a potential non-union, but sometimes th these medications are life-saving medications like chemotherapy or biologic injections, and we can't stop them. And um, we just have to accept the influence that they have on healing. Smoking and alcohol plays a big role. You know, it's typical of our non-union populations. You can see this picture is from a frame patient of mine when I worked in the UK, and he used his the holes on his elizer of frame to store his rollies, and that's our typical non-union patient. Alcohol, so I always just used to say that alcohol doesn't affect non-healing really, um, except if you drink so much that you fall over, but there is uh, definitely a link between excessive alcohol intake and non-union, not just through the um, if, indirect effect of malnutrition, and um, and so forth. So this is quite new that there's more sort of evidence that um, along with the list of other medications influencing bone healing that PPIs have an effect of bone effect on bone metabolism in general and also has a influence on fracture healing. So again, some of you might have seen this video, but this is a real patient of mine. Uh, he was racing his motorbike down the Halswichter Pass in Stellenbosch and the CCTV camera caught him crashing into this poor, unexpected German tourist going at over 200 kilometers an hour. If you look closely at the, at the picture, you can see him flying there. But there's some things that we cannot change in the index event, and this is specifically the injury that has a influence on the potential of the fracture to unite and this is specifically relevant in high energy trauma. Now there's various classification systems when it comes to non-unions. The best known one was originally described by Jude, but better known as the uh, as modified by Weber and Czech and this is describing the non-union according to the radiological appearance into hypertrophic, uh, oligotrophic or atrophic. Elizarov added to this and uh, added uh, to describe whether the, there's a presence of the deformity and whether the um, non-union is stiff or lax. Paley has quite a comprehensive classification for tibial non-unions, also taking into account bone loss, presence of the deformity and leg length discrepancy. And there are various other classification systems taking um, other factors into consideration. The most comprehensive one is the so-called uh, scoring system by Calori. As with all classifications, unfortunately, often the more comprehensive ones might be better, but not really practical for everyday use because it's too complex or comprehensive to remember. So we mostly use the web and check classification or the modification thereof. So Nandu and Len summarized 
uh, this nicely in the series of articles on trivial non-unions. And we like to think of non-unions as these five different types. Firstly, a stiff hypertrophic non-union, then a mobile atrophic or oligotrophic non-union, a mobile pseudoarthrosis, a segmental bone defect non-union, and then lastly, a septic non-union. This is a great quote by Girdlestone, who was a famous orthopedic surgeon, and he said in 1932 that bone is a plant with its root in the soft tissues, and when its vascular connections are damaged, it often requires no techniques of a cabinet maker, but the patient care and understanding of a gardener. Basically, it translates to if you uh, want to be an orthopod that just like a big hammer, not a lot of thinking, then you should stick to um, hip replacements or sports medicine and, and um, not to treat patients with non-unions. And the same really goes for infections. But also, um, in this series of articles, Nandu and Len really summarize the treatment nicely in what they call the five pillars of the treatment of, of non-unions, of which the first is to optimize modifiable risk factors in your host. Second one is to achieve mechanical alignment. Third one is to achieve stable fixation. Fourth is to um, consider biologic stimulation. And fifth is early functional rehab. Now, the treatment algorithms are quite favored toward the uh, treatment, of treatment with circular external fixators. And circular fi external fixators are often uh, fantastic devices in the treatment of, of non-unions. But you can also use other treat treatment modalities to achieve these aims. So this is the treatment algorithm. And you can see that going through this treat treatment algorithm, you can define the five different subtypes as I described before. Now, this paper was mainly looked at tibial non-unions, but the same principles and classification applies to all non-unions. So if we talk about the management of non-unions, firstly, and there's a few things on history that's very important. It's important to have a history of the index event, the presence of implants and previous procedures. Very important that antibiotic history. It's really strange, you know, that patients are often very badly informed. And when you ask them whether they had an infection following fracture fixation, they deny that they ever had any infection. But if you prompt them carefully, yeah, they'll admit to having had wound problems for weeks or months, multiple vacuum dressings, multiple courses of antibiotics. So you need to always specifically ask about wound healing following fracture fixation and an impaired healing situation, as well as um, a history of taking antibiotics. Need to find out what medication they're on, specifically looking at medication that could influence healing. Examination locally, you specifically want to look at the state of your soft tissues. You wanna see whether the non-union is painful, you want to do a careful neurovascular examination and also looking at the adjacent joints in the non-union. So you want to try and classify your local disease, looking at the clinical parameters that I've already mentioned. Then you want to look at the radiological appearance of whether this is an atrophic or oligotrophic or hypertrophic non-union. You want to look at the presence of a deformity or the presence of surgical implants. And then you want to try and identify whether this is infected or potentially infected. You use this on information to categorize your non-union into one of the non-union types that I mentioned before. So the question whether the non-union is infected or potentially infected, well, sometimes it's quite obvious, like in this case, um, but often this is not the case. So one needs to inquire about wound healing problems, previous courses of antibiotics, 
look for the presence of a sinus or ask about previous sinus. And then it's important to try and distinguish between an active infection. So this is a case of a non-union that has signs of an active infection. So local uh, inflammatory signs or the presence of a, of a sinus, uh, a collection or cellulitis in the area of the fracture. This is a low-grade infection where there might be no local signs of infections, but there's positive cultures at the time of treatment. Now, not, infection does not cause non-union. Um, I like to use the phrase that infection and non-union coexist in a similar environment. So they both like conditions of poor vascularity. And in several papers, up to 50% of non-unions thought not to be infected have positive cultures at the time of surgery. So as a general rule for me, every single non-union I treat, I take tissue cultures at the time of non-union surgery if I open the fracture. And if there's infection, I'll treat that concurrently. So I never do a biopsy before the time, but if there's a low grade infection, so there's no hard signs of infection, I would treat the non-union whichever way I plan to treat it in a single stage but I would take tissue cultures and if there's any positive tissue cultures from the time of surgery, treat the infection concurrently. Special investigation, this is part of my host workup and includes an ESR, albumin to look at the nutritional status, in any confirmed diabetic or anyone suspected of diabetes, I look at HbA1c. Now in all elective surgery, it's recommended by the AOS to not do any elective surgery for HbA1c of over 10, specifically as well in non-union surgery, you're very unlikely to achieve um, union of a non-union with poorly controlled diabetes. With an HIV status, specifically a vitamin D, which is the commonest of uh, endocrine abnormality that we encounter in non-union patients. Most, Frequently in non-unions, I only use x-rays okay, and sometimes multiple x-rays, occasionally a, a, a CT scan, um, MRI is mostly reserved for infective cases, and then I very seldom use metabolic imaging like um, <coughs> um, PET CTs or bone scans. So these are, the, these are my treatment goals or my treatment strategy. And this is what I would like you to mention in the, your treatment plan for every non-union. So just like you mentioned in, a, in an exam scenario, when it comes to a trauma case that you would manage the patient according to ATLS principles, when it comes to managing um, complex surgical patients like non-union patients, infective uh, patients, infected patients, um, oncology patients, you can simply use the line, you need to stratify and optimize the host. This would tell your examiner that you thought um, about optimizing your host and addressing modifiable host factors. And when prompted, you can delve into further details. But if you use this phrase, it shows the examiner that you've thought about host factors. Then, the important thing in every non-union you need to think about optimize optimizing the mechanical environment you have to ask ask yourself whether the mechanical environment is optimal for union in this case then you need to decide whether you need to add bi biology or biological stimulation as i said i put it in brackets there that every non-union case i would look for infection concurrently to managing the non-union. And then lastly, early functional rehabilitation of the limbs, very important. Just remember as AO's dictum of movement is life and life is movement. So what can we do to optimize the host? Unfortunately, as I showed you earlier, there's a long list of host factors that influence healing. Unfortunately, most of them we can't change. We can't change someone's age, 
and we often can't change uh, the, their comorbidities. Um, we can encourage people to give up smoking or drink less alcohol with varying degrees of success. We can avoid non-life saving medication that affect healing like anti-inflammatories or steroids. We need to look at the nutritional status of the patient and optimize specifically the protein content. If it's not, correct the anemia and vitamin D deficiency, which are both, both associated with, um, with non-unions. Control systemic conditions, specifically diabetes. Put a diabetes is poorly controlled. Um, you can improve your chances of union by referring the patient to a physician to optimize their uh, management of their diabetes. Treat infection aggressively and don't think of psychological, don't forget about psychological support for these patients. They've often been through various treatment, various doctors, often failed by the system. They've often had bad treatment along the way and um, they can do with some good news. So this is an interesting paper that looked at unexplained pubic rami or sacral fractures and with cases with unexplained non-unions of pubic rami or, or sacral fractures so specifically in the older population and they investigated them for underlying metabolic or endocrine abnormality and they found an endocrine abnormality or metabolic abnormality in a large percentage of patients so always forget it always remember about your host workup. The second thing is optimizing your mechanic environment. And now there's only really two things that you can manipulate to change your mechanical environment. Firstly is stability. So you can um, select a fixation construct that's more or less stiff than what's previously been used. And you can also manipulate the gap at a non-union site. So now we get to your homework. And uh, I've seen this article um, around about the unified theory of bone healing, which is not really a scientific article, but I quite like it because it sort of summarizes the evidence of the influence of mechanics on bone healing. So before we get into the specific of the specifics of the article let me um, pull up this questionnaire and then we can see who's done their homework um, maybe if one of you can just indicate whether you can see the poll there on your screen and then please select the appropriate option or what you think is appropriate on all three of the questions and i'll give a few seconds or a few minutes to do that can someone just maybe switch on their microphone or just indicate to me whether they can see the poll i can see the poll okay I perfect i can't submit though that's the screen del right there we go there's a few answers coming through. There should be three questions. Okay, so select your answers on all three and then submit. Submit at the end. Okay, so we had 15, 16. Twenty. Okay, I'm going to end it there. And we can look at that now. Okay, so um, this is a panel of experts that just got together 
and look at the various theories of bone healing and how mechanics influence bone healing and came up with this um, article. And this is the most important quote for me from the article that they say it suggests that the majority of non-unions will heal if the correct mechanical environment is produced by surgery without the need for biological adju adjuncts such as pathologist bone graft. Okay, so let's look at that poll and let's look at the results. So if we see the first question there, the bone healing and non union theory describes the bone healing unit okay so most people got that right the orthopedic surgeon and his team that is not the answer delroy let me see who's here on the call let's ask let's ask ayik ayik can you explain that to us Switch on your microphone or I'll unmute you. And can you explain the bone healing unit to us as they describe it in the article? Are you there, Ike? Yes, I'm um, here. Yeah. Okay, did you read the article? I read it, but not uh, uh, thoroughly. I just read it quickly. Okay, so let me help you there. So basically, the, um, this theory describes what they call a so-called bone healing unit, and that they this is a functional entity that's made up of the tissue that form in and around the fracture. And this responds to uh, mechanical stimulation um, according to a few principles. So let me ask someone else then. Let's see who else is there. Niku. Okay, Iku. Yes. Again. Niku, so let's see. Everyone got this right. Okay, so they basically summarize the mechanical influences on healing. Uh, discussing Wolf's Law, parent strain theory, and then the Frost concept of mechanostat. So, what is Wolf's Law? Uh, Wolf's Law has got to do with um, the amount, of, the more you strain um, the bone, the more bone will be laid down. Oh, sorry, not yeah. strain, the more you stress bone, the more bone will get laid down. Yeah, so basically, bone turnover responds to to um, mechanical stress or loading and that's in other words the more bone is loaded the more, more bone will form or the denser bone is more unloaded and the classic example is people that go into space for a prolonged time that becomes severely osteoporotic, um, osteoporotic. Um, parent strain theory that's got to do with um, the amount of um, strain that uh, so if if there's absolute stability, then there's very little strain over that fracture site. And parent is quantified according to, um, so no strain is less than 1%, if I remember correctly, that will lead to absolute union, and more than 10% of strain will lead to non-union, and the 2 to whatever is give you secondary unit, if I remember correctly. Okay, and... Um Frost concept of a mechanostat. Uh, I need to go read that again. I can't remember now. Okay, so Frost basically has a similar theory where he basically says there's bone sort of homeostasis is sort of in equilibrium. He calls it a mechanostat and that that is basically influenced in one direction or, or another by mechanical stimuli. For a bonus point, what's Hilton's law? Get rid of the tumor. Say again. <laughs> okay, you don't you don't get your bonus point. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Let's see who else is here. Kirsty. So last question. Everyone got that right. So most non-unions will heal um, 
following the optimal mechanical environment. So Kirsty, what I want to ask you is, um, how do we calculate strain? Uh, strain, strain is change in length over length. Okay. So the amount of movement over the fracture gap. So if you have a small gap with a large amount of movement, we'll have strain, too much uh, strain and then the fracture won't heal. Like yeah, cool. So that's the first part of current strain theory is how to calculate strain. And then the second part is where he described the so-called yield tolerance of tissue. So he says that the amount of strain in a specific fracture will predict um, the tissue that forms in that gap. And in a low strain environment, so strain of less than 2%, um, bone will form. In a, Absolutely. Well, it's absolute stability. Yeah. So primary bone healing. Primary bone healing in a strain environment of between 10 and 2 and 10 percent. That is the optimal environment for callus formation or for the pro progression of fibrous tissue into a cartilage model, basically. And then strain of more than 10 percent leads to uh, basically a fibrous, fibrous non non union. Okay, so. When I look at the um, optimizing the mechanics for uh, non-union, I look at what implant has been used. I ask myself, you know, should I use the same thing again? Often, if something was used and it was appropriately used, then um, you know, you can't keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. So I would try something else. And just an important note here, it's just like in other complex sort of parts of orthopedics, like um, infection or tumors or so forth. It's important that if you don't know what to do, always consider referring to a specialist. Okay, so biological stimulation, and this is a massive topic. So biological stimulation is not just bone grafting. Um, I'm gonna quickly just run over um, what it all uh, compasses. So firstly, biological stimulation can be systemic. It can be local bone graft and substitutes and currently what we refer to as orthobiologics and then lastly, bone growth stimulators. So systemic enhancement, there's really very, very little evidence for the sort of systemic supplementation of uh, uh, in fracture healing. There is definitely some evidence that low vitamin D might contribute to non-union and that vitamin D supplementation can help in union in people that are vitamin D deficient. So in other words, there's no point in giving people with normal vitamin D vitamin D supplementation to try and achieve union. Bone graft and substitutes, well this is a massive topic and you guys will have a separate tutorial on, on this topic but I just quickly ran over the diff different types as we know the ideal graft should have both osteoconductive, osteoinductive um, properties as well as osteogenic potential and the only graft that fulfill all the those criteria is autogenous bone graft. So in a, as a general principle, I like this dictum that you should ask yourself, what do you want to do with bone graft? Do you want to enhance healing or whether you simply want to fill a void or a defect? And then as a general principle, the graft should apply what the host lack and the host should have what's not inherent to the graft. In other words, if you have a hole, you just want something to fill the hole you don't and, and there is healing potential then you just need a void filler at the same time if you don't have a defect but you need to stimulate healing then you don't need something with uh, osteoconductive properties you just need something with osteoinductive and osteogenic potential so autograph as i said is the gold standard when it comes to bone healing and then depending on the specific uh, clinical scenario you can use either cortical, cancellous, or vascularized grafts. Allografts um, in South Africa is all processed, or that's freeze-dried 
lipolyzed or radiated, we don't get fresh frozen or fresh allograft in South Africa, and it's because of the high incidence of infectious diseases. It comes in a very variety of forms. This is just to clarify something. So um, I think it recently came up in the trauma meeting that DMPs, uh, uh, D, uh, DBM or demineralized bone matrix refers to the non-mineral mineral content of bone. So it's demineralized bone. Now, can cellus bone chips or um, block allografts are not completely demineralized, so they are technically called partially demineralized bone matrix because they've retained some of their structures, but it is still contains demineralized bone um, matrix. So it has mostly osteoconductive, but a little bit of osteoinductive properties. What they do then with um, DBM in the powder form is they've completely demineralized it. So it has a higher content of DBM. And this is uh, specifically the proteins that can um, has a, have an in osteoinductive um, uh, effect present, present. And this is bone patties or, or, or different, uh, different preparations that's available. So, Synthetic bone graft substitute is a massive industry, um, but these are mostly used uh, for the osteoconductive properties as void fillers. Some of them, like um, um, Ignite from Wright Medical or some of the other companies, do have um, bone graft substitutes where they have DBM in a matrix, which can be calcium sulfate or something else, so that they do have some osteoinductive properties. They're also useful to deliver local antibiotics. It's important to just um, select the appropriate graph for the environment where you work. So if you want to enhance healing, autograph is the gold standard. If you want to fill a void or you just want a defect filler, in South Africa, cadaver bone is quite cheap. So in South Africa, allograft is a useful void filler and the most cost-effective void filler. So for us, when you have a void filler and trauma, cancellous bone chips are is a um, cost-effective void filler. Now, if you look at the international literature, you'll see that people almost exclusively use synthetic void fillers. Now, this is because Unlike the situation in South Africa, in most um, countries around the world, synthetic grafts are much cheaper than, um, than allograft. They're not superior, and our void fillers in the form of allografts are superior. It's just the most cost effective solution for where you work. So, bone, synthetic bone graft substitutes are just more expensive void fillers, but they are useful for delivering local antibiotics for single state surgery and infection, and that's the only time. Also biologics, and this is mostly referring to BMPs. Now, there's no proven benefit of BMPs over autograft. There's also significant morbidity associated with the use of BMPs, and they cause uh, a significant inflammatory, local inflammatory reaction. So there used to be two different ones available. Um, Ossigraph from Strike and Infuse from Medtronic. At the moment, Infuse from Medtronic is the only one available. It's extremely expensive, and I would say, in, especially where we work in South Africa, it is not worth the effort. Firstly, in the government, can't get hold of it in private. Um, the difficulty in motivating and getting it paid for is not worth the potential benefit. PRP, I think there's no evidence in, tra in enhancing of healing for the use of, of, of PRPs and the same with stem cells. Even though it's very, very attractive and biological manipulation of fracture healing is, a, is an attractive option, there's no high level evidence at the moment that stem cell treatment um, has a proven benefit in non-union treatment. And part of the problem is that there's no uniform definition of what is stem cells. There's various ones available, 
bone marrow aspirates are most commonly used in non-union surgery, but there's also other sources like stromal vascular fraction, of which fats themselves is the commonest, commonest source. So in South Africa, I would say BMPs is not cost or effort effective. PRP or other growth factors, no, there's no evidence. And stem cells, one can consider bone marrow aspirate as an adjunct in a certain non-union certain non-union cases. Bone growth stimulators, again, these include a variety of devices. The best known one is low intensity pulse ultrasound, of which exogen is the um, best known device. There's also electrical stimulation, extracorporeal shockwave therapy. It's got some uh, biomechanical um, evidence that it can enhance healing in a non-union situation. Unfortunately, when it comes to lipos or exogen, the best evidence is against the use. And there are well-designed multi-center randomized studies showing no benefit in acute fractures in regenerative during lengthening of transport when hypertrophic non-unions. So the use really should be limited in to delayed and atrophic non-unions in patients that's able to afford it. Again, one important thing to consideration that um, they don't do any uh, don't do any harm. So, in other words, there's no harm done in using um, exogen. But there's it's important to make sure that your patient understands that there's no proven benefit. Especially in poor surgical candidates, it's some in the patient can afford it. It's sometimes something that they can try out, and if nothing else, it buys time. And time is an important thing when it comes to healing of fractures. So, if we then look at the specific non-union subtypes, as mentioned in Nando's article, hypertrophic non-unions. Uh, these are mostly stiff. So, in a stiff hypertrophic non-union. Uh, with a deformity, first line treatment, especially in the lower limb, would be closed distraction with a hexapod circular fixator. We'll discuss that a little bit more. In the reason for that is in cases without the oh, in cases with a deformity, these non-unions are often so stiff that the non-union can't be the deformity can't be corrected. Um, in closed means. In other words, to correct the deformity and using another fixation method, you have to take down uh, the whole uh, the whole non-union. Non you can consider nailing in the ones without a deformity, but important, you need special tools because the canal is often shut off and you need a selection of, of, of solid flexible reamers to basically make a canal. Beware of the radiological appearance of a hypertrophic non-union that is mobile. This is most often a pseudoarthrosis and would not respond to the same treatment of a hypertrophic non-union. So a hypertrophic non-union with a nail in situ, an exchange nail um, would be the first option. Very important not to dynamize. And this is probably one of the biggest errors I see in patients referred uh, to the non-union service where a diaphyseal fracture with a hypertrophic non-union with a nail in situ is dynamized. The problem there is stability. By dynamizing, you just make the instability worse and um, it, there's no chance of it, of it healing. Compression nailing is also attractive where you can make it further stiff by putting a bigger nail and also doing controlled compression. In metaphyseal uh, hypertrophic non-unions, um, we consider plating, and of course in the tibia, always uh, consider adding a fibrinosteotomy. So this is, uh, is a concept that I found really strange when someone first mentioned it to me, and I was taught as a junior trainee that in a hypertrophic non-union, the treatment is to add stability. And how do you add stability? Well, you add stability by adding a plate or putting more fixation in it and to try and compress the fracture to make it more stable. Now for hypertrophic non-union, there's fibrous tissue in the cap, but the bone ends are still biologically active. And you can influence the strain as you, if you think how strain is calculated by change in length 
over cap. So you can have an effect on strain by decreasing the movement. So that's by making it stiffer. And you can further increase the strain by increasing the gap more than keeping the gap stable. So if you would plate or nail these, the, the gap would stay the same and you would just change the movement or the change in length. So you can have a more profound effect on strain by treating these with closed distraction. And with closed distraction, it has a 89% success. And that's with a closed treatment without opening the fracture site. And it's just beautiful um, mechanics in motion, um, basically. So in atrophic or oligotrophic non-unions, traditionally they're thought to be avascular. Now this is a bad quote of an old study histologically, and if you've been in surgery with a non-union, you'll know that the, uh, atrophic non-union is not a vascular. There is vascularity histologically, but in these cases, one should consider biologic stimulation, but it's always important to optimize the mechanics first. And then again, Nandu and his team coined this term, which is called mechanobiology, and this is stimulating biology through optimizing mechanics. So in, in other words, having a, a, a biological enhancing effect by just optimizing the mechanics in a non-union. And if you look at the breakdown of the atrophic tubule non-unions, in the 100 odd tubule non-unions, they only had 33 atrophic or oligotrophic um, non-unions. They all united after treatment, and only seven of them required bone graft. So only 21% of them. I don't want you to take home that it's wrong to bone graft a fracture, but bone graft is mostly for cases where there's a gap or a defect, and you must always first consider optimizing optimizing the mechanics. Now, I'll probably do a, a non-union case a week, so that's. 50 odd 50 plus cases a year and cases where i purely do a bone graph so basically without bone graph without changing the um, fixation that is present i probably only do every other year so it's very very unusual to do a bone graft only in a non-union in a non-union case beware of the pseudoarthrosis and these are cases with a hypertrophic appearance on x-ray but they are mobile and very important that they are pain free and in these cases the fracture have lost all the biologic potential and um, the bone ends covered with cartilage and often synovial fluid and you need to treat this with aggressive excision and reconstruction of the defect they will not heal with the normal treatment modalities that you use for um, that you use for hypertrophic non-union so this is just an example actually low pseudoarthrosis are much more common in the upper limb than in the lower limb but this is a tibial pseudoarthrosis this patient underwent two separate distractions with a frame at another unit for what was thought to be a hypertrophic non-union. He presented to us with this radiologic appearance in a completely mobile tibia. It would have been 30, 40 degrees of him standing on it, but very importantly, without pain. And we had to treat this with a resection and shortening and intramedullary nailing in this case, mainly because the patient had not run on the frame again, and then you can see the fracture, fracture united. I want to just briefly mention this fourth type that Nandu described at the segmental bone defect non-union. And I would say this is not really a non-union because one should have never expected this to unite osteoblasts or osteocytes don't jump so when you have a bone defect you need to reconstruct the bone defect unfortunately occasionally patients present with untreated bone defects and um, 
this is what's referred to as a segmental bone defect non-union. Often in this case, is, you know, you follow the same treatment algorithm as you would for um, treating a bone, treating a bone defect. And this is what we refer to as the reconstructive ladder um, of the lower limb. So an effective non-union, effective non-union really falls under the treatment algorithm for chronic osteitis or fracture related infection. I'll just briefly mention that infected non-unions, the treatment aims is different from prosthetic joint infections like um, uh, prosthetic joint infections like affected uh, uh, hip and knee replacements where our aim is to achieve union and to prevent eventual chronic osteitis. So if there's progression in the union and the fixation is still stable or adequate, then one can treat the non-union by the retention of the implant and treating the infection or suppressing the infection until union and then treating the infection once union is achieved, mostly only with removal of the, of the implants. If there's no potential to unite or there's no progress and the fixation is not stable, then one needs to resect the infected non-union and treat it as structural chronic osteitis. So infected non-union as an adult um, without progress is really the, the a, a, a type four or structural chronic osteitis and need to be treated with the same treatment algorithm that's not part of today's topic. So again, if we look at this um, treatment algorithm from the New and Lynn article, um, as I said, they have a heavy frame bias with the treatment and the same aims can also be achieved using other fixation methods, but in principle, um, I treat all non-unions according to this treatment algor algorithm. So what sort of results can you expect? Well, 10 to 20% failure rate, so that's 80 to 90% success rate in appropriately selected surgical cases. And that is really important that um, if you operate on everyone with a non-union, including the very poor host with no chances of success you're going to decrease your success rate so you need to achieve good results you need to select appropriate surgical cases and you especially when you um, uh, embark on resecting bone and so forth you should always ask yourself what's the worst thing that can happen if the patient has a limited morbidity from the non-union you should make sure that they're going to better off be better off after the treatment than before. So if you go and resect a lot of bone and now the patient has a bone defect and doesn't heal, then the patient needs an amputation. So if they have minimal disability in the beginning with minimal pain and they were fairly functional, sometimes better to leave it, un leave it untreated. So what factors are associated with treatment failure? Well, smoking, no surprises there, excessive alcohol intake, time from injury. So basically time, from injury is not a contraindication to the treatment of non-unions, and I've certainly treated many non-unions successfully two, three, four, even more years down the line, but you have to take into consideration and explain to the patient that the longer a non-union is present, it does affect the chances of, this, of a successful outcome. And then bowel alignment in the tibia has, has been associated with treatment failure for non-unions. So there's a few specific clinical scenarios that I want to run through. Humeral non-unions. So this is a systematic uh, review that was recently published looking at all the evidence on the treatment of humeral non-unions and summarizing all the treatments. They said that overall uh, union was achieved 98% of cases with plate and bone graft. 95% of cases with plate only, lower with a nail or a nail and bone graft, and the same results achieved with an X-fix. However, uh, the, the complications in the upper limb of a X-fix, specifically a circular external fixator, is much higher and it's more cumbersome for the patient. That's why the majority of upper limb or humeral um, non-unions 
we treat with internal fixation. These are mostly revision or a fixation with plates. And I you know, firmly believe that if you sure you have two healthy bone ends and you plate them together, that there's no a need for, for bone graft. And this is true in the majority of cases. Forearm non-unions, and one of the problems with non-union and the forearm is that because you are very, very limited with the amount of shortening you can do of one bone in the forearm, often by the time you've sort of slightly debrided the fracture end to make healthy, you the left with a bone defect too large to, um, to shorten and very useful in the forearm is tricortical cancellous graft that's described by this um, old article in the Journal of Hand Surgery um, for, for defects in their series up to five percent out of the five centimeters but I've certainly used it for larger defects with a high um, success rate. For lower limb non-unions with a nail in situ this is a very important article. The first line treatment mostly is an exchange nail, but it's important to know what the results to expect with an exchange nail. So the um, success rate of an exchange nail for a femur shaft non-union is in various studies shown to be more than 90%, so 90 plus percent. As shown in this study here by Hamish Simpson from Scotland, tibial non-unions, the treatment uh, success is lower with exchange nailing down to 63%. In their study though, they also treated infected non-unions with an exchange, so known infected non-unions, so this is a non-union with a sinus or signs of, or hard signs of infection, they still treated with an exchange nail, and uh, that lowered their success rate. So in other studies where they excluded infected non-unions of the tibia, they achieve a success rate of around 70%, but definitely lower than the femur. And that's why some centers for tibia, even with the nail in situ, they would um, go for a circular fixator. For me, I always do an exchange nail first because um, it, it has got the, the highest sort of proven success rate in the literature. In this series, factors associated with failure of treatments is infection, and of the infected cases, only about a third healed after single exchange now. So more eventually healed, but needed more surgical procedures. So it's a bit controversial, but some people would still do a single stage exchange now, even in infected non-unions, there are more sort of newer treatment modalities using antibiotic coated implants, which is attractive, and that I've also tried with success a few times. An atrophic pattern and a gap of more than five millimeters were also associated with treatment failure. Now, this is an interesting concept, and this is what we call strain manipulation. So, this is in lower limb and also in the described in the humerus. A non union so for nav in situ, where instead of an exchange nail, one try and manipulate the strain by adding a compression plate. So it's not ex actually exactly new, as you can see here from the first article for the Journal of Trauma, it's described in 2008 with a high, su with a high success rate. And we'll discuss some of those clinical, uh, some of those cases and the clinical cases. So this is an attempt to manipulate the strain without doing an exchange nail. So for me, I normally do, do one exchange nail. If we go look at that previous study for, from Hamish Simpson, in some cases they did up to five exchange nails in a patient. Now, I just can't get myself to do the same thing over and over four or five times and to, to expect a different result. So if, if a patient has had one exchange nail and that was done properly, in other words, followed all the principles of an exchange now, so it's reamed, it's a size up, you aim to, to increase the diameter by preferably by two millimeters, then as a next line treatment, I would go to further um, stabilizing the fracture with either screws or a 
uh, plate augmentation. Like anything, unfortunately, this works better than in the femur than in the tibia, um, and can be used in the femur with a high success rate. Subtrochanteric fractures is a specific uh, difficult group. We see there the incidence of 5% doesn't sound that high, but just remember per trochanteric fractures, the incidence of non-union is less than 2%, so very low. So it's more than double, almost three times the incidence uh, of non-union as in per trochanteric fractures. The big risk factors here is more reduction and uh, patients being on bisphosphonates. So again, surgical options. Union can be achieved with a variety of devices, including intramedullary devices or extramedullary devices with or without bone graft, but reduction is paramount. And often in a stiff non-union situation, it's very difficult to correct the deformity with a nail. And therefore, we often use other devices for subtrochanteric non-unions. And then after process, always a uh, uh, um, salvage option. Now, for the tibial non-union with a nail in situ or previously treated with a nail, in most centers, an exchange nail would be the first line treatment. Um, it's quite novel, but also an option in other tibial non-unions. And this is Nikus M. Med, and as he showed here with a few cases that union can be achieved in a high um, percentage of cases, the suprapatellar entry, um, makes this a lot easier because of the straight working channel. You need often need some special tools because it's not a canal, um, but it's an acceptable treatment in case of out an active infection um, with no significant gap or in a hypertrophic non-union with out nail where there's no significant deformity. And this is from the article here where you can see a previously uh, uh, this patient must have been from Somerset because he was previously treated with a biplanar um, external fixated leading to a non-union. As you can see there, this was successfully treated with a femoral osteotomy and a compression nail and united. So again, the send and take home message. It's always important to give attention to the host. Um, it's important to optimize your mechanical environment. Um, you should have a treatment strategy for every specific type of non-union and you should set yourself clear treatment goals and then decide how to achieve. In non-union surgery, more than any other part of orthopedics, there are a lot of different ways um, to treat a non-union. So that's why it's better to define your treatment goals and then say how you're going to achieve it. Because if you say, my aim of treatment would be to increase the stability and I would achieve that by using a compression plating as an example. Even if I thought I would use a nail myself, if you mentioned that you want doing that to um, increase stability and you would do it through compression plating, I would be happy with your, with your answer. So if you set goals, as I mentioned there before, you need to optimize the host you're going to optimize the mechanical environment by X, Y, and Z. You're going to consider biological stimulation by adding bone graft or not doing it for whatever reason and rehab. And then you can mention how you would achieve those goals. No one would argue with you. So before we run through some cases, is there any questions from the audience? Okay, no questions. I've got quite a few examples here, sort of uh, just there for everyone to learn. Please ask a question if you have a pressing and I'll nominate some of the senior senior guys to to give us their, um, their point of view. I see Yapi there. Yapi, are you alive? Okay, I'm unmuting Yapi. Yapi, are you there? Okay, seems like Yapi is still um, affected by COVID. 
somehow. Let's see who else. Okay. Mike. You I'm here, Are you there? Okay, cool. I'm here. So, um, with a lot of these cases, I'll show some history prior to the presentation of the non-union, and uh, then I'll ask you to comment. So, this is a, a, a the first case to show. This is a 43-year-old motorcyclist, great orthopedic patient, previous BKA, as she was riding her Harley with a prosthesis and had another crash. This was done at another hospital and she was fixed with a retrograde nail. And this is when she, this is still at an index unit. And um, this is what it looked like at seven months. Maybe I can ask you the, um, Mike, what do you think? Yeah, so it's an AP and lateral of a femur. It's a segmental fracture. Uh, you can see there's a transverse fracture mid shaft with a butterfly fragment and then uh, a distal also comminuted fracture with another butterfly fragment. So it's, it's uh, from this injury pattern, it looks like a high energy injury. Uh, so you're already at risk for a non union just based on the fact that it's a high energy injury. Um, uh, looking at the nail itself, um, I can see. So, what, what are we dealing with here? Seven months, and this is the radiological appearance. It looks like a. a it's going on to an established non-union. I can see no callus uh, around, especially proximally. I can see absolutely no evidence that this is healing. Okay. Um, uh, how would you the, classify? The issue, here for, the issue here, obviously, as you said, you would uh, like to optimize the host. I don't know what a host status is like. Yeah. But yeah here good. is more me uh, mechanical stability. Uh, I don't think this nail was done very well. I can't see many proximal screws I can only see maybe two uh, above and so below. So there's one but proximal I'd... screw it's also backing oh, is it out. One? Yeah. Oh, is that... Okay yeah so I think the issue here is we're dealing with a, a mechanical problem it's an it's an atrophic non-union using uh, the classification you described earlier but I think if you improved your mechanics uh, you would probably get union here. Okay, so this is what was done at the index surgery. What have they done? They've taken out the distal locking screws. Uh, so they've, and they've, they've tried to, to dynamize, so it would be the opposite of what I was planning. Okay, good. So, yes, and predictably, it didn't predictably work. Predictably, it would get, yeah, it won't, it won't help. Okay, so it won't now work. it looks like she's developing. Uh, a lot of callus around the proximal site. I'd be worried about uh, developing a pseudoarthrosis now. Uh, it would be difficult to tell if it was mobile and painless because she's still got a no. nail inside. Yeah, but uh, she definitely has pain. So you, 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 you uh, right that you should consider, but remember it's always mobile. And if you carefully look, there's no gross loosening around the nail. Um, if you have a pseudoarthrosis with a nail in situ, that nail should be rattling around. So there's no real... Fair enough. Okay. Um, yeah. So she's obvious. now she's now got an established non-union. Uh, yeah. There's too much. Practice. There's too much strain there. So this um, this demonstrates the point that I mentioned earlier in a in a dynamization. Um, you know, in a case that needs more stability, it does not achieve union. So what would you do now? Um, so should. So we're dealing with you said a hypertrophic non-union. You're going to optimize the host. What would your treatment goals be? So my, my goals would be to improve mechanics to get union. Um, okay, good. So I think for her, an exchange nail would be appropriate. Uh, I think she can get two millimeters longer and then get more proximal and distal locking so you can improve mechanics. I don't think she needs any biology. Okay, good. So, so um, you can also argue that an exchange nail would have some biological effect through reaming, um, okay. but mostly you would. That article the you spoke about said they weren't sure about the effects yeah. of the reaming. They said it's just yeah. transient. So, I yeah, don't know what your sure. opinion of that is. So, there's always this theory that it has some bone grafting effect reaming, but actually, the best evidence shows that there's no grafting effect of the nail. 
and there is lab evidence to show an increased blood flow to a non-union when you remit. So in other words, mm. um, they call it, initially it was thought just like with rimmed nails and acute trauma, that the reaming would have a detrimental effect by destroying the end osteal blood supply, but they describe what's called the reverse shunt effect, where the, it actually increases the periosteal blood supply, so you have an increase of blood flow to a non-union. Uh, but as they mentioned in the unified therapy model, they've actually shown that that's just transient. So most likely, the biological effect of um, exchange handling is not significant. But now, just to get back to a little bit, and this one's always important to think uh, or to plan very carefully with these cases now, for a retrograde nail, this is already at 11.5, and this is the thickest retrograde nail that you have available. So um, you want to put in a thicker nail, but so it's a retrograde nail. So how can, so what can you do? Uh, so option, one of the options, I suppose you could go prograde. You've already made a, a incision on the, on the femur, but you could essentially do a prograde fracture, a prograde, um, yeah. Okay. So this is what I simply, did. Simply because, simply because the distal fracture looks like it's united, uh, that would have been a concern going prograde if it was a very distal femur. But now you're dealing with a mid shaft diaphyseal femur, in which case a prograde is is, is an appropriate. Um, yeah. Good. So um, decided to because you couldn't increase the size of a, of the rainy. Unfortunately, it's another six months later, still hasn't united. I can't blame, blame anyone else because the stomach was me, the, the last operation. Um, what now? So, look, once again, if you've ruled out that there's no infection there that, uh, and you still think it's a stability problem, you could, okay, so you've got a CT that's proven that's a non-union, there's no trabecular across the fracture. You can potentially add another plate, a laterally-based locking plate to improve your like increased stability, as you said, with that article from 2008. Yeah, good. So this is what we did. Yes, a strain manipulation um, to another way. This is already a 30 now. I'm, I won't do another exchange. Now it's already the thickest now. And um, still, in a, obviously, you open the fracture here, but you don't take the non-union down. Just apply. And it's not locky. This is a compression plate to try and make as stiff as possible with those non-lock screws applied first to get as much compression as possible. And you could also use an interfract screw if it would allow you the nail, but there's often not space. And then those other unicortical screws are placed after the compression. And here you can see four months later, um, uh, completely united, again, united without yeah. bone graft, just, just um, mechanical stimulation. Okay, mm. you, are, you are off the hook. So let me look at the grid, whoever's, whoever's next. Um, maybe I can ask you to also switch on your camera. Okay. Um, Pravesh, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Pravesh, look at this case, 47 year old, 18 months following a tibia fracture. That was treated in an X fix with some screws. And what are we dealing with? Yes, it's an epilateral series of a uh, of a leg X ray. So on this fracture, we, on this X ray, we can see that there was initially a segmental fibula fracture, uh, sort of mid shaft and distal tibia fracture. So it will be medial associated with the medial malleolus fracture as well. And so it's eighteen months now and seems like there is an established non-union already uh, with uh, the recurvitum deformity on the lateral and sort of slight uh, various deformity. Okay, what type of non-union? What type it's of non-union? I say it's a, you can classify it as sort of oligotrophic non-union because yeah, uh, there is an elephant foot. So I say hypertrophic non-union. So it's an, okay. it's a, Hypertrophic non-union. Yeah. Hypertrophic okay. Non yes. With uh, deformity. So yeah, I so say there is a recurvitum. There's some deformity. Okay. Yeah, there is some deformity. 
Okay, so seven year old. If we go through our treatment algorithm, you would do a normal host workup. Host what would be your workup. what would be your goals of treatment in this case? So optimize the host first, and then my goal of treatment will be achieve union by by improving the stability and. I don't think we need biology as well here. But the problem is that the fibula has already united, so obviously there is a, a stability problem. But we have to we'll have to do, to do a fibula osteotomy when we when we, while dealing with the to improve the stability of the fracture. So how will I improve the stability? Will be an intramedullary, intramedullary nail uh, for the for the tibia with a, a fibula osteotomy, no bone graft. Okay. Any concerns uh, with nailing this? Concern will be because it's 18 months down the line, so the canal would have been obstructed already. So we'll need specific or special reamers to, to no, get down. Special yeah. Well, I would just say, except if you're Niku, um, because Niku can nail anything, um, just be a little bit careful in a case like this with a deformity. These are often so stiff that you cannot move them. And even with the fibula osteotomy, in this case, you might struggle to um, get a nail down there. In other words, the, the nail would not uh, straighten that bone. But definitely, like you said, the principles are correct. So this one is an example of where I treated it with a closed distraction. You can see here, do you see how complex this frame is? Um, not because I... Um, wanted to impress Liesel and use a lot of components. These are incredibly stiff. So as a principle, both proximally and distal is a ring block with lots of fixation. And um, to correct this deformity, so correcting the deformity, as you can see on this long leg view and adding some distraction there on the zoomed in picture, you can see the fracture gap. Um, let me just get the laser pointing there. You can see the fracture gap at the end of destruction. And here you can see three months post-op, but starting to unite. And this is at the time of frame removal. So completely united. So this is an example of closed destruction for hypertrophic, hypertrophic non-union. Okay. So um, you're off the hook. Let's see who's let's see who's who's next in line. Um, Ayik, are you there? Yes. Okay. So this is an example. Uh, I'm going to first just show a little bit of background. So this guy had an open tibia fracture. Uh, not treated by me, treated with this uh, monolateral external fixator uh, and an and attempt at treatment, definitive treatment like this. So he comes to my clinic uh, with this radiological picture at six months. Uh, so here I have a, a, a tibia fracture with a segmental uh, fibular fracture, a comminuted fracture with a butterfly. There, it is uh, implying that it was a high energy, and like you mentioned there, it was open fracture. So the obvious problem here is, uh, is a mechanical instability. So, yeah, so what type of non-union did you say? Let's just go through the algorithm. So what type of non-union is that? So this is, would be a, a trophic non-union. Trophic, okay, good. Yeah. So you do your whole work up and what would be your goals of uh, treatment here? The so goal of the treatment here would be the stability is to stabilize the, uh, the patient, the, the fracture. So we'll put more uh, stiff um, uh, constructs rather than a mono. A mono, it wasn't a, con, uh, a stiff construct. Yeah, so this is never stable enough to treat a fracture definitively. You can see how loose these pins are. So um, your aim would be, I like that, even though it's hyper, it's atrophic, you still say that you will first optimize your mechanics. I agree. But remember, if you think of the strain theory of Perrin, you can have no callus with either a, a fixation that's too stiff, so strain under two, 
but much more commonly you have no callus formation when strain is too high, so strain more than 10%. So um, it's very seldom that you have no callus formation in a situation where it is too, it is too stiff. So still mechanical, uh, mechanical stability here first, you can consider, I wouldn't say it's wrong here, yeah, adding a bone, bone graft or adding biological stimulation, but it's not necessary. If you carefully look, there is a little bit of callus. Um, and all we did for this patient is to further optimize the mechanics by doing a fibular osteotomy, closed treatment, so no bone graft, and just a very um, sort of uh, uh, biologic friendly Elizroff frame, and then union of the four months. Okay, so this is another case. Maybe let's uh, give someone else an opportunity. Jono, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, can you hear me? Okay, yes, can you hear you? Okay, so again, a little bit of background first. This is a 72 year old uh, professor of music that had this humorous fracture of the simple fall. He was treated like this. And um, 15 months later, he was referred to me with this radiological picture. So um, I'll leave it there and tell me what are we dealing with. Okay, so we've got an AP and a lateral series here of a right humerus showing a fracture mid shaft. Um, it's got an L in situ that's interlocked. Um, and there's a non-union, which I would classify in this case, looks like it's a hypertrophic uh, non-union. Okay, good. So I'll give you some further uh, details here that if you look carefully at this lateral, you'll see that there's massive sort of lysis around yes, the yeah. nail. The nail is almost eroded through the anterior cortex and he has absolutely no pain. And, and he can actually do this trick when he tells me, if I sit next to him, he can move his elbow and you can hear a click. So you can hear that nail rattling in his arm. And he thinks it's quite funny because he he's, feels absolutely no pain, no, no pain while doing that. Yeah, so definitely starting to worry about a pseudoarthrosis in this case. Okay, good. So you're dealing with a mobile pseudoarthrosis, host, you'll do your host workup, and then what would be your goals of treatment? Okay, so here, because it's a, a pseudoarthrosis, um, it does need stability, but I also need to get rid of the, I need, I need to excise the, uh, excise the pseudoarthrosis. So it would, be, it would be excision of the pseudoarthrosis and then stability. Um, and then... Now would you achieve that? Uh, so th that study that you showed, um, you know, the, the X-Fix uh, gave good stability, but so did a uh, plate with either with bone graft or without bone graft, um, and it gave it with less complications. So that's what I would do. Uh, um, if I'm going to be opening it anyway to excise the, the, uh, the pseudoarthrosis, you there, so I would excise the pseudoarthrosis plate and then uh, with or without uh, bone graft. Okay, good. Yeah, so exactly what I've done. You know, I try and avoid external fixator or frames in the upper limb as far as I can. So this is, a, you can see it's a rather large arm. Um, so we already have to do a big open uh, approach to take down that pseudoarthrosis, um, you know, dissect the nerve, protect it, and then treat it with a compression plating and not adding any biological stimulation, but just making sure we have two healthy uh, bone ends. And there is a picture of him five months later united. Okay, so this is a another case uh, to illustrate some important important uh, points. Chichi, you there? Just unmute yourself. Yes, my can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so let me show you some background first. So this is a 31-year-old female pedestrian uh, with this uh, segmental femur fracture treated up one to far treated uh, yeah this is a background so treated with a recon type nail um, and then at 10 months had a nail breakage you can see there the distal fracture united and a nail fracture through the proximal non-union site 
and it was changed to this device. Any comments? Any comments of the uh, about uh, what was done? Okay. So I'm looking at two AP actually showing uh, part of uh, part of the heap as well as the as the femur. So the first X-rays are showing an intramedular device with uh, fixation failure. Looks like the the nail is broken in the trochanteric lesser trochanteric region. Then the second X-ray is post uh, fixation with another cephalomedullary device. Um, from just comparing the two, I suspect the first X-ray, the fixation was in in varus, and uh, in the second in the second X-ray, um, when they did the fixation, the plan was so it looks like they they corrected the varus, and it looks like there's still some some attempt of uh, of healing, but it looks like there's still minimal amount of colors around the fracture site on the proximal end that is in the second picture. Okay, so what I would just add here, and this is changed to a PFNA, um, okay. and the PFNA is 130 degree, and with a 100, 130 degree neck shelf angle, if the yeah. screw is in the middle of the neck and ends up high in the head, it tells uh, you that it's still in some varus, which is obviously um, a little bit of a, a little bit of a um, concern. Okay. So fast forward. So this is now another year later, and this happens, and uh, now she is referred to you. So what would you do now? Okay. So my my concern here is one my goals of treatment is mechanical stability. So firstly, what are you dealing with? It's it's what what type of non-union? Um, I think this looks like an oligotrophic sort of uh, non-union. Okay. Oligotrophic, um, atrophic non-union. So my goals of treatment include stability and uh, improving your biology. Okay, so you would achieve, you want to achieve stability. How? How would you do that? So I would think in this case, I would consider using a plate. Um, and if I'm using a plate, considering that I'm going to be opening up, I will still remove that nail, then clear up those fracture ends to bleeding bone. Then I'll use a, a plate with compression at the fracture site, but at the same time, um, uh, trying to acquire the normal neck shaft angle in the same setting. Okay, good. So exactly what we did. So you can see here that we resected the non-union to correct the deformity. Uh, Classically, this operation is done with a plate. Plate, the distal fracture is united, so we don't have to span that. And using the plate to correct the varus and correct the deformity. So the learning point here really is that, and subtrochanteric fractures in general, but also non-unions, very important to not be in varus for the mechanical forces, and also that a bone defect on the tension side in the femur is very poorly tolerated. So if you go back. Okay. You can see here from the very first X-ray, there was always a little bit of a gap, even after the um, after the revision. There was a little gap there on the lateral cortex, and that's very poorly, very poorly tolerated. Okay, good. Okay. And then just uh, lastly, two cases to show some important uh, principles. Again, this is a previous polytrauma. And you can see I uh, had a both bone forearm orif, and at six months, you can see here that the radius is united, um, but there's a non-union of the ulna. Even though the plate still looks well fixed, there's actually a gap there. So there is, no, you know, I would have said this sh shouldn't, you know, one shouldn't have really have waited this long. This is not really a non-union. This, we know, you should have never expected this fracture to unite. This was a bone defect from the beginning. 
Um, so as I mentioned um, previously, in the forearm, we limit it with the amount of shortening we can do to a few millimeters. So here, after our basic workup, treat the patient with a tricortical cancellus. So it looks like there's very little bone in there, but that's just because of the density from the tricortical graft. So this is a few centimeters of tricortical structural iliac crest allograft, plated with compression, and you can see a few months later that's united nicely. And then just the last um, case to show that you can't solve all uh, you know, non-unions, and this is a elderly, well, not so old, but 56 year old, but low demand patient with rheumatoid arthritis. And this is why it's important to look at the adjacent joint. This got a proximal tibial non-union with a completely destroyed joint. This was definitely inadequately fixated, but on top of that, a fracture where um, this non-union, probably why she fractured in the first place was because of the long lever arm and the stiff knee, but now there's no chance that this would have healed with the fixation they used. If you wanted to plate it, you should have used two plates to make it very, very stiff. Um, now there's an established non-union 15 months following, or if there's a big deformity and an abnormal adjacent joint. So in this patient, I thought it was better to refer to Tom, and Tom did a large, uh, uh, um, tumor prosthesis for her endoprosthesis to basically solve both problems at the same at the same time okay so that's it from my side um any questions from any of any of you guys Uh, uh, hi, it's Ashley. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Ashley. That, that, uh, that uh, female nail that was uh, revised to a proximal femur plate, did you do it in lateral when you did the final revision? When you took out yes. the, the nail? So whenever I do um, removal of nails or exchange nails, I do it in the lateral, in the lateral position. So I never do it in traction. It's much easier to take the nail out um, in a lateral position. You can maximally adduct the leg and then um, plate it in the same position. So patient always in the lateral. I do always do anterograde femoral um, exchange nailing or removal nails in a lateral position. Okay. All right, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, well, we'll call it then. Um, but it's, yes, go for it. Who's, who's talking? Uh, it's uh, Grunis. I just want to quickly ask you, um, just for interest's sake, that case one that you showed, um, uh, that distal fracture has yield, and uh, in your article that you sent us to read, they talk about multifragmentary fractures that sometimes, most of them heal, but you are sometimes left with an oblique uh, fracture non-union. And that yes. proximal aspect looked quite oblique. Is that a, also a good example of that? Which they yeah, that's a that's a very good example of where there's a um, that one. We don't necessarily call multifragmentary, but there's a small small bending wedge. So the wedge yeah. united, and it formed a single oblique plane deformity. Um, that illustrates the sort of strain theory well, where initially for that fracture there was a large gap, so it tolerated movement and it could still have a, an acceptable strain environment. But once there was a single plane um, uh, non-union, that same amount of movement with that fixation resulted in a high strain environment, basically precluding union and, and, and forming a single plane, uh, a single oblique plane deformity, uh, non-union. Okay, and then just the other thing I want to know is that the um, case that you showed the recon nail failure and then they repeated surgery with the PFNA. Uh, if you had the chance to do the second operation uh, before the third one where you uh, uh, managed the patient, would you have considered doing another cephalomedullary nail as well? With a larger yeah, so I must say, if I normally do an exchange nail as a first line, so I'll do an exchange nail as a first line. 
um, in cases like that, but then make sure um, that I use a device with a neck shaft. So, uh, so basically you have to look at what, the, what fixation device was used. Sometimes, like uh, if there's a deformity and there's a device with a large lag screw up the neck, you basically cannot correct that deformity and use the same device or a similar device because it would just fall into the same hole. Um, okay. In that case, there was a recon nail used with two small screws. I would have um, revised it to a Kefler medullary uh, device as well, but then just taking great care to make sure that I don't leave it in various. And if I was worried at all with the stability, I would have considered um, adding a small anterior plate to further, uh, to make it more stable. And if there was a defect on the lateral cortex, I would have grafted, I would have grafted that okay. defect. Oh, fantastic. And then, John, just the last thing is your case on the professor. As part of that biologics, did you ever consider telling him to change his taste in music? <laughs> he was a pianist, actually. <laughs> he was a okay, pianist cool. and a very, <laughs> a very strange character, actually. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Have a good evening.